This reading is taken from the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, from verse 16 to 21. No, this is what spoken by prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will sh show wonders in the heavens above and sigh on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood for the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so uh, the Jesus' friends sat in the upper room and they waited and they waited and they prayed and then the Spirit was amongst them in a much more dramatic sense than an air zooka, and in a much more dramatic sense than a little pot of incense, which is now outside, by the way, just so those with asthma can cope. <laughs> and uh, in a much more dramatic sense than tongues of fire and a candle, but the presence of the Spirit upon them in a manifest way. And what that did... Those signs, those tangible signs, the things they could smell and taste and feel was to give them assurance, hope, something to grasp. Because if there's one thing that Pentecost says is that without it, the Christian faith is just a good idea. God may have done stuff. He may have interacted with the world, but it would just be a story from the past. Something that happened back there or over there or away from us. Jesus didn't say when he ascended to heaven, gather in Jerusalem and once you've got there, you can have a really good seminar on Christian philosophy. You can work out your mission strategy. You can come up with some good ways to reshape society. And you can even talk about the ideals of the crucifixion and communicate them in a decent theological paper. He didn't say that. <laughs> he said, gather in Jerusalem and you will be empowered. You will receive a counsellor, an advocate who is like me, who will be with you, guiding you, comforting you, teaching you. One who will be with you so that just as I have been sent, you may be sent. So that you will do what I did and all I did is I did what I saw the Father doing. So now by the power of the Spirit, you can do what you what see the Father doing. And so that here amongst you, my friends, that prayer that I taught you, your kingdom come, O Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, may actually be answered in you. That the kingdom of God may be in you. So the Holy Spirit bringing that kingdom in you may be a foretaste of what will be true for eternity. A down payment, a guarantee that what will be will be because it has started in you. So Pentecost is meant to be climbing, bringing together all the stories. Like that, the time when Moses' day, remember in Moses' day where they had that time when the people of Israel rebelled and they worshipped a golden calf. And Moses ended up pleading with the Lord. And one of the things he pleaded was, go up with us, Lord. Stay with us. If your presence does not go with us, then do not send us up. How will anyone know that you are pleased with us if you're, unless you go with us? What will distinguish us from anyone else unless uh, you go with us? Pentecost is the Lord saying, I am with you. When Paul speaks about the manifestations of the Spirit, he speaks of God's people meeting together, empowered to prophesy and to speak God's truth. 
And the response he expected, if people came in and saw that happening, wasn't them saying, oh, that was a great church service. We scored well on Mystery Worshipper on shipperfools.com. He didn't expect someone to say, oh, the preacher had a really clear oratory that day. What he expected people to see was to walk in, see the work of the Holy Spirit amongst a bunch of ordinary people and say, surely the Lord is with them. Which is quite a reverse compliment. It's like, look at these guys. (laughs) Surely the Lord must be doing it. (laughs) But it's about the presence of God. And so when Peter gets up, at that first Pentecost, to explain what is happening, the tongues of fire, the wind, and all those other sensory experiences, what well, he gets up and he talks about what, all that, what the sense of that. This is how the Lord is amongst us. See, here are signs of the Lord's presence. And therefore, remember who we are. We are the people that the Lord was with. We are the ones who have can do what the fathers do. We are the ones in which the kingdom is coming. Therefore, have hope. And so when he got up to speak, this is what he spoke of. Can we put that passage back up again? In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit and your sons and daughters will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams and even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. These are those days, Peter is saying. And today I want to say to you, today is one of those days. Those days have not ended. In a minute we are going to baptise some of our young ones. And we do it for a number of reasons. Out of faithfulness, out of obedience, out of joy, out of celebration. But we also do it out of hope and with a sense of what it means to have the Lord with us. As we do it, we are praying, Lord, as they pass through the waters, hover over them like you hovered over the waters at the beginning, like you hovered over your son in the River Jordan. Fill them anew. Send down your Holy Spirit. May they be aware of your presence with them. We're saying fill them with courage. May they dream dreams. May they have visions and see what you are doing. As they go up from here, as they go up from the waters, go with them so that a generation may know that you have set them apart as ambassadors of grace and carriers of your hope and knowers of your heart. Be present with them. And we pray this prayer for these young ones, not out of desperation, and certainly we do it with some yearning and desire and certainly with echoes of the prayers that we've prayed for ourselves. Lord, we also want to dream dreams and see visions. We want to know your presence with us. But we pray with confident hope. Each one of us here, and each one of us here, and I think the more grey on your head or the less hair in your head, you will know this. Each one of us here has lived in the grace of our own baptism. And each one of us who knows that the life of journey's life, the life's journey can hold the good and the bad. It isn't always easy. Our belief in the Holy Spirit is not some prosperity gospel, nothing's going to go wrong. We have all been through the thick and thin thin and the joy and the pain and the weariness and many of us have the scars and the wounds to show for it. But speaking for myself, I can say, if the Lord had not been with us, how would it have been? In the dark night of the soul, it feels like we're alone, but as we have the opportunity to look back on it, we have the sense of how he was there with us. We have a testimony of belonging, and we trust and pray for that for our young ones today. Jesus, the Son of God, died for us to make us his own. He rose again to lead us into the framework of life that would be the shape of his people And in the light places and in the dark places, in the good times and the bad, we know it is true. The Lord is with us in this room today, comforting, teaching, warning, holding, maybe even enjoying the frivolity. Who knows the ways of the Spirit? It's like a wind of a presence who can predict it. But we simply say and pray, Lord, 
do it more. And especially today for Simeon and for Zebedee and for Faith. Be present with them, Lord, as you set them apart for the work of grace to which you have called them. May they dream dreams that you have given them. May they bring your kingdom in their generation and beyond. Amen.